This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 1st, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we examined the Dunleavy budget legacy so far. A lot of spending growth and a lot of PFD cuts. Second, we explained why the Permanent Fund Corporation should no longer be trusted. And third, we explained how the Hill Corp loophole keeps growing and what that means for the state. And now, let's join Michael. We start off uh, with the big news uh, on Friday, the governor kind of quietly issued his vetoes. In fact, he did all the vetoes on Thursday and then didn't announce it until 4 p.m. on Friday, which is a calculated move, obviously. not wanted to miss the news cycle, but uh, he had his budgets and he signed, uh, he signed, uh, or he vetoes, and then he signed in the, the budget into law. And so that's where we're going to start on the weekly top three. Give me your, give me your, your, your take on this. Well, in the governor's announcement uh, of the of signing the budget and the vetoes, he referenced a number, and that's sort of like a red flag to me. Of, of oh my gosh, there's a number. Let's see, let's see if that number is true. Uh, the number was in the last sentence of of his press release. It says, since FY 2019, budget growth has averaged 1.2 percent annually. Well, I've been working on on the numbers since I saw that on Friday, and I can't find it. I mean, maybe if you throw in all of the federal spending, and maybe if you look at it from, you know, tilt your head to the right and then to the left, and then sort of twist it around, you may be able to find that number. But I haven't, I haven't found, I haven't been able to recalculate that number. Here's what I found, though. And I think, and I think this sort of encapsulates the Dunleavy administration sort of, and sort of shows what's going on with the Dunleavy administration. And, you know, it is what it is. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying anybody else could have done better, but this is, this is what's happened. Bill Walker had a total UGF spend uh, in FY19, which is sort of, which is the baseline to, from which to evaluate the Dunleavy administration. He had a total UGF spend of $4.8 billion. The FY24 budget that we just finished and the reason I'm going to use the FY24 budget is because it's got all the supplementals, the FY24 supplementals in it. The FY25 budget, which the Dunleavy administration would want to tout, doesn't have any supplementals. Uh, and you know they're coming next year. It's got $170 million in so-called surplus in there already set aside for, for supplementals. So the, the, the FY25 budget really is, is, is not comparable to... You can't go back and say, well, we're going to compare this against FY19 because FY25 doesn't have the supplementals in yet. But the F, so the FY19 budget, the Bill, last Bill Walker budget was $4.8 billion. The FY24 budget, the one we just finished, the one that has all the supplementals in it, is $5.5 billion. Uh, that's, that's five years. That's the effect of five years of the Dunleavy administration. We've gone from $4.8 billion to $5.5 billion. That's a, about a 15% increase uh, over that period of time, over that five years. If you average that out, that's about 3%, not 1.9%. That's about 3% growth. 
if you do it on a compounded growth basis, that's about 2.75% uh, percent, uh, growth uh, over that period. So when, when, you, when, when you start claiming, when the Dunleavy administration starts claiming they've kept spending under control, well, it could have been it could have been twenty percent growth, I suppose, but it's been fifteen percent growth. It's been average uh, over the five years. It's been average three percent growth. Here's the here's the other numbers that I think are 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 to, to set aside to set alongside that number. I think are important. Um, looking at the PFD, the statutory PFD over that five year period would have grown, did grow. I mean, you can still calculate the statutory PFD. It's still in the statute. The statutory PFD over that period of time grew from $1.9 billion to $2.25 billion. These are gross numbers. These aren't broken down to per PFD, but 1.9 up to 2.25. That would have been a growth in the PFD over that period of about 18%. Um, and that would have been you know, a significant growth over that five-year period. What happened with the continued PFD cuts under the, under the Dunleavy administration and Dunleavy signed the budgets. What happened under the uh, with the PFD under the Dunleavy administration is we've gone from 1.02 in the Walker in, in the last year of the Walker administration. And remember, was a, we thought at the time that was a fairly deep PFD cut uh, down to 1.02 billion dollars, roughly one billion dollars. The the FY24 PFD is 880 million dollars. So while spending has been going up. Uh, over uh, over the five year period, the PFD has the stat and the statutory PFD would have been going up or has been going up over that period. The actual PFD over that period, the amount set aside for the PFD has gone down by roughly thirteen, roughly fourteen percent, about the same fifteen percent, frankly, that the that spending has gone up. So during the Dunleavy administration, while spending has gone up. Uh, over those five years, 15%, the PFD has gone down about uh, 15% over that same period of time. So, yes, it could have been worse. I mean, you could have had people who uh, didn't veto, frankly, the little bit that, the, that Dunleavy vetoed along the way. Um, but it it could have been worse. Uh, but it's not great. Uh, from the standpoint of saying I can straight if, if Dunleavy's claim is I constrain spending to you know less than two percent, which is what they're trying to claim in the in the press release. If Dunleavy's claim is he's, he constrained spending to less than two percent, he didn't. I mean, th these are UGF numbers, unrestricted general fund numbers, um, which is what everybody uh, uh, agrees is sort of the discretionary part. What the what the legislature and what the governor has control over. Federal funds are just flow through deep. DGF designated general funds are largely flow through. This is what the this is what the legislature and the governor have to play with, and that's gone up about fifteen percent over the five years, about a, a, an average of of three percent growth uh, over the years. While the PFD, which Dunleavy came into office claiming he was going to protect, is is an absolute amount, has gone from a billion dollars under Walker's last year, uh, after after Walker cut it down to $880 million, a decline of 13% uh, over that over that period of time. So it's not, you know, to 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 claim victory, as I said, that that putting putting a percentage number, a, a claim percentage number in the press release was sort of like a red flag. Rather than claim victory, I would say that the job that the Dunleavy administration has been has been on the negative side. Uh, spending growth, I, I, I will give him spending growth. That's not that distant. The, the amount of spending growth is not that distant from inflation. But at the same time, to see the PFD cuts increase over that period, to see the D PFD decrease as an absolute dollar figure, both as a percent of the amount of the statutory pivot, uh, PFD, the statutory dividend, uh, the actual PFD is decreases a percent of that, but also to de decreases an absolute amount over that period of time, I think is a failure on Dunleavy's part. If you look back at the, if you look back at the 2018 campaign and what he said about the PFD and and what he said about the PFD continually since, I think that's a, I think that's a failure on his part. So now, it's, it's, you, you can't take these budgets at face value. You've got, you got to dig into them and understand what's going on with them.
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with it. And to me, I don't always look necessarily at the percentage as much as I look at the actual raw dollar figure. And when you figure out that, you know, since his uh, his finalized fiscal year with supplemental budget in 2020 was nearly a billion dollars less only four years ago, going on five years ago, and you extrapolate that out and you realize, well, if we're going to do a, if we're going to double it, if we're going to do, if we're going to do a billion dollars every five years, it doesn't take long. I mean, the 10 year projections then are justified in what we've been talking about. And it goes on from there. I mean, we're going to be there. I mean, it's going to be out of money, right? Because it's, if they're adding a billion dollars every four or five years, that's a significant, uh, that's a significant jump. And there's, we don't have the money to pay for that right now. Well, it, it, it wipes out the PFD for sure. And, and it flips you back into deficit. Uh, if you, if you add another, another billion dollars, the big, the big problem here when you look when you look through the years is FY23. We got a bunch of oil money in and the legislature sort of went catch up. Uh, well, they, they, they not only caught up to where they were, but they sort of went a little bit a, a, a ahead. We jumped from FY22, the budget was at $4.9 billion. We jumped up to $5.6 billion. We jumped, uh, 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 what is that, six, six billion, or $7 billion. Uh, or seven hundred million dollars, rather, in in one year, and that's and that's really where where the Dunleavy administration lost control. They will claim that the PFD also went up that year, and so Alaskans got some benefit of that, but but not by the same percentage. The PFD right. didn't go up right. by the same percentage as as spending went up, and we still had PFD cuts. We still had okay. about five you know, on an absolute basis. We still had about five hundred million dollars in PFD cuts in FY twenty three. In an attempt to be fair to the governor, because he's obviously not doing all this alone, he did run on protecting and having a fully funded PFD. Um, so what what should he have done, Brad? Uh, you know, because, again, he can't add money to the budget. He can only veto uh, and subtract. And then that's back in the hands of the legislature. And the legislature has been hell bent on election of basically taking and tapping the PFD and using it as a money source. That's why we haven't had it. So in fairness to Dunleavy, what should he have done differently, in your opinion, to protect the PFD, which, again, was a huge campaign issue for him in both elections? Well, I think the fiscal policy working group has outlined it, Michael. I mean, we, we talk about that. We talk about that repeatedly on the on the show about the fiscal policy work, working group had outlined a little bit of everything, uh, a little bit of spending cuts. Uh, a, a little bit more from oil, which I think is just as we've talked on the show, which I think is is justified. A little bit from top twenty percent non-residents uh, in terms of a broad-based tax, as opposed to the targeted tax that uh, the PFD cuts are. Uh, a little bit of spending cuts, uh, with and and capped by a spending cap. And a little bit of PFD cuts. I mean, I mean, part of the fiscal policy working group was to go from the current statute down to POMB fifty fifty, which is which is a material cut uh, in in an, in itself of the of the PFD. So a little bit of everything. The problem, and the governor himself last session, not not this immediate last session, but the session before when he came out and he talked about you know the brief moment in time he talked about a sales tax. He said, the last thing you want to do is to shove the responsibility for fit, for for balancing the budget or for fixing the fiscal uh, 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 state's fiscal situation on one group. The last thing you want to do is focus it on one group. You want it to be broad based a little bit on everybody as opposed to a lot on on one group. But that's exactly what what's happened here. I mean, but through PFD cuts, it focuses the the impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. You don't get any contribution from non-residents. You don't get any contribution from oil. You don't get any contribution from the from the top twenty percent. And I think I think looking back um, and and looking at the issue as the fiscal policy working group did at the time, I think the little bit from every from everything. I think if the governor had endorsed that, uh, we would be miles ahead at this point. Donna says it's more telling to use the fiscal year 20 as a starting point. Dunleavy's first budget compared to his latest UGF was 4.3 billion in tw fiscal year 20. And uh, compared to the fiscal year 25, which is uh, $6.3 billion. So two, almost a two point, uh, almost a, a two point uh, 
uh, $2 billion uh, uh, difference in the fiscal years from his first to his next. Yeah, that 6.3 counts the PFD. You're including the PFD as part of UGF right. when you right. do that. And I, and I think it's much better to strip out the PG, uh, to strip out the PFD and look at that separately and look at spending, government spending on programs and on capital budget uh, uh, separately. And those were, those were the numbers I was using. But yeah, I mean, you can pick any point. <laughs> FY, FY20 was in fact smaller, was a, was a lower spend than, than Walker, even, even with all the pushback he got on right. the vetoes, he managed to, to get FY20 a little bit lower and he managed to get FY21 a little bit lower than that. And then sort of the wheels came off the bus, big jump to FY22, even bigger jump to FY23. Uh, and FY24 is about the same as FY23. So there, there was there was a period. I mean, you can if you want to if you want to tighten up the time frame uh, and and make a worse comparison, there is a there is a period of time when it looked like Dunleavy was keeping the wheels on the bus, uh, and then the wheels on the bus came off, and uh, yeah. and and it was a and at, at, that's at the same time as the. As spending is going up, the PFD is starting to come down. The gross amount of the PFD is starting to come down. Any thoughts on any of the vetoes here? we got about two minutes. Any of the vetoes that stood out for you on this? Uh, I thought they were pretty innocuous overall, but anything that really stood out to you, Brad, on the veto list? No, it was sort of, uh, it, there wasn't there wasn't one veto that, that, that really looked like, you know, it made progress. It was sort of, you know, picking here and there. And I'm sure there's a rhyme and reason to it, and I'm sure it has to do something with the legislators and the districts where the where the vetoes occurred. Uh, but it just sort of looked, you know, uh, very small in terms of the overall budget. What the vetoes were about uh, 200 million dollars, or plus or minus maybe 300 million dollars, if you want to be generous. Uh, the overall budget is 5.3 billion dollars uh, before supplementals, uh, and there's a hundred another. $170 million in surplus, you know, extra take from the PFD that, uh, that, that the budget does. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's just really, it, they're minor, minor vetoes and, you know, they may be irritating to whoever got vetoed, but, but in the big scheme of things, they're just not that big. Yeah, no, I mean, I was again, and I saw, and I thought it was a little weird that the way they did it, where they did it on a Thursday and then didn't announce it. Like, there would have been some great hullabaloo, but I mean, Josephson was stomping his feet and standing. He seems to be the poster boy for uh, the stalking horse for all the shouting and everything else uh, on everything. But really, there was not a lot in this that was, you know, shocking, I guess, is what I was saying. Not a not a huge amount of controversial cuts in this. So um, but I mean, I'm happy to see it and I guess we'll see uh, where it leads to. Brad Keithley in the weekly top three continues. We're on to number two where Brad says the permanent fund corporation is not to be trusted. Uh, there's a, I mean, I, I just said it coming into the break. I mean, dare we say scandal? Is it scandalous, the behavior, or is it just inappropriate? I mean, what, what's your take here, Brad? There's a lot of things going on, and uh, some people think it's not a big deal. Some people involved think it's not a big deal, but other people's do. Give me, give me your rundown here. Well, I, certainly the permanent fund board uh, executive director Devin Mitchell is trying to minimize uh, uh, the what's going on. He did that at last week's hearing. LBNA Legislative Budget and Audit held a hearing last week uh, focused on the permanent fund, uh, and Devin tried to paint a a great picture that everything's good. You know, we're we're, we're rocking along and we're we're achieving good things, uh, but it was in the context of legislators all sort of pushing back and saying, "No, you're not." <laughs> Uh, and Devin just kept trying to minimal, minimize the uh, the various the various things going on. There were a couple of stories out of that that are that if people didn't read them. They're worth checking. One, James Brooks had an article that said after email that was headlined after email leak, some Alaska legislators say they're skeptical of permanent fund direction. And then there was another one um, uh, in uh, well that was the Beacon the same the same story. Uh, uh, that, uh, that James wrote appears in a number of, of different places. But here's, here's my issue uh, with what's going on with the permanent fund. Also last week, there were a couple of stories that uh, Sean McGuire did one in the ADN that said permanent funds spendable account faces first potential shortfall starting in July. 
And the same story by a different author or the, the same general gist of a story by a different author over in Alaska Public Media says why permanent fund managers are again sounding the alarm about a key account running low. And this is the storyline that they've been trying to build that you, through the permanent fund dividend and through inflation proofing and through the draw for, for government, uh, we're draining down the earnings reserve and uh, and and you know we're in danger of running out of money in the earnings reserve that, such that we wouldn't have enough to pay, write the checks for uh, the POMV draw, uh, write the checks for government or write the checks for dividend. And the, the next step beyond that is we're draining down the earnings reserve. And so we ought to merge the earnings reserve with the permanent fund corpus and just take start taking the POMV draw uh, down from that. That's the that's the entire intent uh, of behind the the permanent fund corporation strategy. They released a a paper which is one of their major policy papers called Trustees Paper Number Ten that focuses on this merger of the earnings reserve and the POMV. And they're using this. Uh, uh, this tool of saying we're draining the earnings reserve, there isn't going to be any money in the earnings reserve as a manipulative tool uh, to uh, to try to try to manipulate everybody into supporting the merger of the two accounts. Well, wait, they're creating a crisis. I mean, is there is you're saying the crisis of their own making for their own ends? Say it ain't so. And and it's just it's a it's a it's a horrible it's a it's a horrible twist that they're they're trying to do. I mean, the reason that the earnings reserve is running down is because over the last uh, uh, five years or so, the legislature, with the governor's signature, the legislature has taken eight billion dollars out of the earnings reserve with, that doesn't that that it wasn't required to do, wasn't part of inflation proofing at the time, wasn't necessary for inflation proofing at the time, wasn't responsible for any, wasn't important for any other reason, took $8 billion out of the earnings reserve and shoved it over into the permanent fund corpus. And so if you take $8 billion out of something, it's going to have less. And, right. and if, and if it, and if the earnings reserve account, you know, goes up and down over time, if you take $8 billion out, you've taken, you know, a lot of the reserve that was in the earnings reserve uh, out and put it someplace, uh, put it someplace else. The, so at the time that they took that $8 billion out, the first tranche, at least, the first $4 billion was justified as prepayment of inflation proofing. We're going to, we've got inflation proofing come up, coming up. We know that. We're going to prepay it. We're going to move this money over to the corpus, uh, over to the principal, and we're going to prepay inflation proofing. That means if you prepay something, that means you don't have to pay it again when it, when it comes due. And so they left that prepayment in there for a couple of years, and then they started paying it again. And now, and now they seem to have forgotten the footnote that said it was it was a prepayment has disappeared from the permanent fund uh, corporation's uh, monthly records. And and so they they've moved the eight million billion dollars over there. They forgot it was a prepayment, and they started making the prepayments again. So now you're draining the fund a second time, right? You've you've drained the eight billion dollars out as a prepayment. Now you're not recognizing the prepayment and you're starting and now you're starting to take a billion dollars plus a year out again to move it over to the uh, to the earnings reserve. You're paying the bill twice uh, or move it over to the permanent fund corpus. So th there's just it, it's manipulation. What they're doing is blatantly manipulating the earnings reserve to make it look worse um, to, to, you know, add add a storyline to why they need to. Uh, to combine these two things together. Combining the two things together is bad because if the permanent fund doesn't earn the 5%, and we've talked about, we talked about on last week's show and the show before that, I think, that the earn that the permanent fund's not earning the, the CPI plus five, inflation plus five percent. If it doesn't earn that, it's not filling the earnings reserve uh, at a rate that can keep up with the draw. And it hasn't done that for for several years now on a, on a rolling basis for several years. Like four out of the last five years, it hasn't earned CPS CPI plus five. So it so what they're trying to say is, look, we need it. We need to combine the two. We're not refilling it at five percent at CPI plus five, um, but we want to draw at CPI plus five. Essentially, draw at CPI plus five. And what that's going to enable you to do is start eating away at the corpus. This is all is set up to start eating away at the corpus. 
And so it's and so the manipulation that the permanent fund board, the permanent fund corporation is engaged in, it really makes me. Th- I mean, aside from all of these shenanigans that the board's up to, uh, in terms of the things they're doing, the Anchorage office, the investing in Alaska businesses that go bust, um, uh, and and all the stuff that Ellie Rubenstein's doing. Aside from all that, they're engaged in this manipulation on the earnings reserve account, and I just don't. At, at this point, I don't think I can trust. I don't think people, anybody should trust what yeah. the permanent fund corporation is saying uh, about their financial situation because because they're just manipulating it in a way to try to get to the end result of being able to to to, to take from the corpus. You you know me, Brad. I hate to say I told you so, but I mean I've been saying this for twenty years that the whole intent is to get access to the corpus of the fund. That's the whole point, because it's just too big and juicy a pot of money not to be able to do it. And we've seen this collusion between the Permanent Fund Board and people like Bert Stedman, who've orchestrated it on the legislative side, to push all this money out of the earnings reserve to create what is an artificial crisis. I mean, if that $8 billion was still in there, then this wouldn't be, they they, they wouldn't have the ammunition to make these stories, you know, to write these stories to say, oh, it's running out of money now. Uh, and again, to conveniently forget that it was supposed to be. And and remind me, the POMV, part of that deal was that inflation proofing was baked in, right? It wasn't, you know, further inflation proofing was not required. Uh, according to SB 26, that was one of the shiny silver linings of it. And yet they're acting like they've still got to, to do it as if it's the statutory formula. Well, they, they still do have to do it. They have to move it from the earnings reserve. The money's in the earnings, earnings reserve. Uh, what you, what the earnings reserve should be doing is is getting CPI plus five, CPI being the inflation portion, and they and they still need to move the inflation portion out of the earnings reserve over to the permanent fund. But they did that with the prepayment, Michael. I mean, here's here's the deal: the earnings reserve shouldn't be being drained the way it is because it all because the corpus already has eight billion dollars of prepayment prepaid inflation proofing. Having that's been moved over to it. There's still five billion dollars. They did it for a couple of years. They did the prepayment for a couple of years, but there's still five billion dollars of excess prepayment sitting over in the corpus. So we could go five years at current rates of inflation. We could go five years without taking any money out of the earnings reserve and putting it into the corpus. That's how much prepayment uh, we already have in there. When they say there's a crisis. What they're what they're what they're saying is we can't do the POMB draw plus inflation proofing uh, because you know it, that that's just too much. That's more than what's that's than what's the earnings reserve is receiving uh, from the from the corporation or, or how much reserve it has in there. But if they turned off inflation proofing, which is what they said they were going to do when they did the when they did the prepayment, if they turned off inflation proofing, not only would the earnings reserve be okay, but it would start building back up. Uh, over over a period of time, right? And so we've got. I mean, I mean, we've just got we've got manipulation on top of manipulation that's going on here to try to try to justify trustees pay for ten, try to justify you know setting up a system where people can go in and start and start draining the uh, uh, draining the draining the corpus. And of course, your solution to this was a complete rejiggering of the permanent fund board to actually put professionals in there instead of having it be a political board, essentially. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, every you, you look at Texas, you look at other sovereign wealth funds around the nation. Texas has two of them. They have two school-related uh, permanent funds, uh, and they have a statutory requirement that that people on the board have substantial background and expertise in investment in in the in the industry that the permanent fund board should be engaged in investments that's all they should be doing they shouldn't be trying to you know jumpstart the alaska economy by by investing a portion of their money in that all they should be focused on green eye shades blinders just on investment and other boards that are like that have the requirement that that those who serve on those boards have Statutory terms, substantial background and experience in that in that area. We don't have that. Yeah, the first highest purpose should be to maximize a return of the fund. Period. Full stop. That should the be, only. Yeah, that, that should be the only purpose. That that shouldn't yeah. be just the the first purpose. That should be the only purpose uh, of the yeah. fund. I saw that the governor did not veto the one billion dollar transfer that was uh, linked in uh, on the thing, and so he's 
helping to perpetuate this uh, this man made crisis here in this in this situation. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional or an oversight or what, but it starts to raise questions when they are they're functionally creating a crisis to then be able to exploit it down the uh, down the road. Yeah, it's it's they're not countering the negative. I mean, they're the 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 negative story that that the that the permanent fund corporation is putting out there about you know the earnings reserve being drained. The the, the administration is not doing anything. Uh, to counter, to explain that story, to put the context around it, to explain that the earnings reserve is not in, not in, uh, in, in, in dire shape, that there is this prepayment sitting over in the principal that we don't have to make the, uh, the prepayment or the inflation proofing out of, uh, out of the earnings reserve. The administration is not doing anything to counter that story, and I don't know if it's because they don't want want to go up against Bert. I don't know if it's because they don't want to go up there per- against their permanent fund board that that the governor's appointed. Uh, and and start uh, pointing out uh, problems that his own board uh, has created, but for whatever reason they're not they're not countering that na- that narrative, and so we're setting up a situation. He- here's how that situation plays out, Michael. Let's say we finally drain the uh, the, the 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 PFDs, right? And we get down to the point where now we're going to have taxes, right? Now the top twenty percent is going to have to pay taxes, and now the oil companies are are going to have to pay uh, are going to have to up their game to what uh, what what the the revenue maximizing level is to use a term economists use um and and they're going to have to start they're going to have to start contributing what they're setting up is a situation where they can say no we don't <laughs> because look at this we merged the permanent fund principal and the permanent fund earnings reserve together we can continue taking 5% of that or maybe 5.2 per, 25% of that or maybe we can cut back on inflation for proofing that we that we that we contribute to that um, in a way that they then start using that as a way to avoid to avoid uh, uh, taxes or alternative revenues and start draining the permanent fund down in in the next effort uh, the next wave. I mean, we 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 went through the wave in the twenty teens of we're going to drain the CBR SBR in order to avoid taxes. Now we're going to drain the, then we drain the CBR in order to avoid taxes. Now we're draining the the permanent fund dividends in order to avoid taxes. And the fourth step is let's set up this merger between the earnings reserve and the permanent fund corpus. And then we'll just start draining the permanent fund corpus down uh, in order to avoid taxes. And that's, Uh that's for all the world. That's what this is setting up. I mean, it's a self-licking ice cream cone. I mean, you're eating the seed corn, diminishing returns. I mean, it, it, that only goes on so long before you, you know, draw down more than than it can return. You know, I mean, but at, at, at that point, does it just drain the permanent fund down to zero and we just keep avoiding it until, you know, until the $70 billion is completely gone? Uh, I mean, that, that's, you know, is that the plan? You can calculate a trajectory. I did that in a column a few months ago. You can see you can calculate a trajectory where that happens. Um, that that column was focused on trustees paper 10 and on what a stupid idea that was to merge the two uh, to get together. And I said one of the one of the potential consequences is you drain you drain the fun on down. And you can do that. And what's going on? is this generation, this generation of the top 20% in the oil companies are saying, we don't want to pay taxes. We just don't want to pay taxes. Thank you very much. So drain the SBR down, drain the CBR down, drain the permanent fund dividend uh, down. And when you and when you get to the end of that, then we'll start you know, using this new trick we developed by merging the, the ERA and the earnings reserve account and the corpus together. We'll start using that new trick to start draining down the permanent fund. And yeah, you know, maybe in 25 years, it'll all be drained, but we'll be gone. <laughs> we'll we'll right. have cashed out. We'll have sold our companies. We'll yeah. have drained, drained all the oil. We're going to drain. It'll be somebody else's problem, but we'll be great uh, uh, during the during the intervening period. That's what's going on. <laughs> and and nobody is really. Br- I mean, you you are the only one that I've seen write about this. Uh, in any of the major publications anywhere in the state, uh, everybody else, Sean McGuire, et cetera, is just towing the line about how this is a crisis, not how the crisis happened, not how it came together, not, you know, the mechanisms of it and how we all just need to get on board with this idea of combining the corpus and the ERA. And uh, again, I, I hate to say I told you so, but 
this was the plan all along, apparently. Uh, and and here we are. Okay, we're continuing now. Brad Keithley, the weekly top three on this Truth Tuesday. Uh, we've got number three, which is all about Hill Court as they expand their influence while the state's uh, horsepower in this situation contracts. Uh, Brad, uh, tell us tell us your thoughts on this. All right, let's 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 go back to first principles on what on the, on the Hill Corp loophole and what the problem is. There are basically five pieces to the Alaska oil tax system. One is production taxes, a second is royalties, a third is uh, 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 property taxes, uh, but but a, the third largest and a major piece of it, significant piece of it, is corp- the corporate tax, and the corporate tax is a tax especially designed for petroleum companies, a tax that taxes the corporation's profits. The reason you have these different ways to get at uh, a corporation's uh, at, at oil revenues is because some years, some of those tax uh, approaches are down. If production's down, for example, royalty be down. Even if prices is up, prices are, prices are up. Uh, royalty be down because of because of production declines. And so you have these different pieces. Corporate, the corporate tax, the petroleum corporate tax, is is an important, significant piece of the overall picture. Hill Corp isn't subject to it. It's not that they don't pay all of it. It's not that they get away with a, just paying a portion of it. They don't pay any of the corporate income tax because of the way in which their corporation is structured. At the time, the, at the time the petroleum corporate tax was put together. All the all of the co- major corporations in the state were what's called C corps, um, uh, C corporations. That's after an Internal Revenue Code uh, numbering system. They were C corps, um, and so the tax was designed to apply to C corps. After that, or subsequent to that, elsewhere in the United States, there grew up a a, a, a number of what's called S corps that are organized differently. Right, and the S and the S corps on uh, and the S corps just were different. Didn't matter to Alaska because we didn't have S corps. We had C corps. And so our corporate tax system worked just fine. But when Hillcorp bought out BP, really when they bought out Chevron and Marathon down in the Cook Inlet, um, uh, they substituted, they they came in with an S corp uh, as opposed to a C corp. And because the tax system was focused on C corps, Hillcorp wasn't subject to it. Minor deal uh, uh, as, as long as they were down in the Cook Inlet. But when they bought BP, um, they uh, uh, supplanted a corporate tax paying entity. BP was a C corp. They supplanted the corporate tax entity with their S corp, uh, and and all of a sudden, the Hill Corp exclusion, the Hill Corp loophole from the corporate tax system grew huge uh, as a result of them replacing BP, where BP had been paying about a hundred uh, million dollars a year in corporate income taxes. All of a sudden, we were getting zero from that segment of the industry because because Hillcorp was excluded as an S corp, um, and and so that's been a problem all along. That's been a that, that's been a growing problem as their as the as their corporate income grows. It's been a growing problem uh, all along. Now uh, we're beginning to see an, a new consequence of this. The headlines this past week has been Hillcorp says it plans to buy Ennies. Uh, oil fields on the La- on the Alaska North Slope. There's a couple of oil fields that are owned by uh, an, an Italian oil, oil company, E and I, uh, referred to as Eni. Uh, and there's a couple of fields on the North Slope uh, that they own, and Hillcorp is proposing to to buy those fields. Eni's been an S corp paying taxpayer, and now all of a sudden this fungus of of Hillcorp not paying corporate taxes. First, it you know applies in the Cook Inlet, not a big deal. Fungus, then they acquire BP. Fungus starts growing, uh, much bigger, uh, and now they're going to acquire any uh, any fields, and they're going to supplant another corporate taxpaying uh, taxpayer with Hillcorp. It, the the consequence of that is the the portion of revenues, the, the amount of revenues that the state's getting from the corporate income tax, the petroleum corporate income tax, is going down. And but but spending is going up, so we know what happens, right? We know who's really paying for this. Additional PFD cuts are being are being used to 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 you know stem that gap, to plug that plug that hole that's being created by the by the Hillcorp loophole. 
big enough with the, with with the Cook Inlet stuff and with and with BP. Now by acquiring any, it's going to grow even bigger. There's one other consequence of this that that I sort of stumbled onto as I was thinking about it. We've given Hillcorp a competitive advantage. Let's say there were two companies, and there may have been two companies bidding on the any properties, right? Company A, which is a C Corp, let's say Conoco wanted to bid on it. Company A, which is a C Corp, uh, and Company B, Hill Corp, which is an S Corp and not subject to the to the corporate income tax. Hill Corp can bid more for any for the for the any properties or for any properties on the North Slope than a C Corp because it knows it's going to get the tax advantage from from acquiring that property. It's not going to have to pay as much costs in terms of in terms of corporate taxes attributable to that property as as another company as a competitor might. So not only are we creating a hole in the budget through this Hillcorp loophole, a hole in the budget that's having to be filled with PF additional PFD cuts. Not only are we doing that, we're giving Hillcorp a, an advantage, a competitive advantage in acquiring new properties. Right. So this fungus fungus is not only growing, the state is 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 allowing or is feeding the fungus and allow it allowing it to grow to grow even larger. I mean, any sitting there, any he's going, and he's going, I'm getting so much out of this property, I've got to pay corporate income taxes. That gives me a certain amount of return. Hillcorp's going, well, I'm I'm gonna have costs with this property, but I'm not gonna have corporate income taxes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be better off. I, I tell you what, any I'll throw in a little bit in the purchase price for you to leave and for me to get the advantage and for me to get the advantage of that. We're really setting up a situation in which Hillcorp can sort of this fungus can sort of grow and, right. and metastasize uh, mm -hmm. as it acquires additional properties. Well, and in fairness, I mean, look, the difference between for a C corp and an S corp for most people is that the S corp is more of a private corporation, where the C corp is a publicly traded corporation. So they have different rules because they have to answer to different outside people. And the bottom line was there's just no tax. There's just no tax law or statute for the S corp because they didn't foresee it. So when you say it's a loophole, you're just saying they're missing money that's on the table. Is that what you're, that's what you're saying here is that, because it's not like they're avoiding taxes, they're tax, they're a private corporation uh, that has private shareholders. It's not a publicly traded company. So that was the appropriate structure for them, but they're taking advantage of it is what you're saying. Well, Michael, I, I, I say it is, I, I say it is we're leaving money on the table. I mean, the petroleum corporate tax was, is a part of the overall petroleum tax. And it was designed to raise a certain amount. The petroleum corporate tax is designed to raise a certain amount in a certain way. Um, and the and the contemplation at the time we the state developed the petroleum corporate tax was that everybody was a C corp and we were going to get that share of revenue. If you think of it as a pie, we were going to get that share of the pie, that piece of the pie, through the corporate petroleum tax. Everybody, with all, all the oil companies were going to were going to contribute into that share of the pie. What's happened with uh, with Hillcorp is by supplanting a C corp, which is which is how the, the 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 tax was built, because that was the that was the structure of corporations at the time of, 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 of oil companies on the slope at the time that that it was built. By supplanting a C corp with an S corp, uh, a piece of that pie has suddenly disappeared. A piece of the revenue. Of the of the total revenue picture that the states designed from designed to get from petroleum has disappeared. It's the same thing as if, in terms of revenue impact, as if Hillcorp was somehow exempt from paying production taxes or somehow exempt from paying royalty. There's a piece of the pie that is missing, a piece of the revenue pie that's missing uh, because because Hillcorp isn't isn't contributing to it in the way that the pie was constructed. Um, so it's, I, I think, to me, the much better way to look at it is here's the here's the tax, the petroleum tax, or here's the tax on petroleum companies that we intended in this state. Part of it was to come from the corporate tax. Hillcorp is through a loophole, through its structure, is is not contributing its share uh, of uh, of the corporate tax, and the state's going, uh, state's uh, losing money as a result of that. I mean, this is on the state because as if, you know, I, I was looking at the other day, I was trying to figure out if I, you know, how I wanted to form a certain company or whatever. And I was looking at all these different corporations and everything. 
I mean, if somebody was going to tax me and I had the opportunity to create an S corp versus a C corp because they weren't taxed, that's still within the law because there's no. So I guess what I'm saying is the loop, the, you know, the term loophole, I think, can be loaded in some ways. But this is on the state. They have to write a statute to include S corps in the thing. This is not, you know, Hill Corp doing anything wrong. They're just utilizing the law as it sees fit and they're maximizing the returns to their shareholders, which is what they're supposed to do. So this is more on the state to get their act together, in your opinion, other than, uh, you know, it's not Hill Corp just doing anything wrong. They're maximizing their profits. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah, but they're maximizing. Yes, uh, but they're maximizing their profits uh, uh, at a loss to the state. The state should. Yes, the state is the one who could fix this by saying, look, we intended the petroleum corporate tax to apply to all corporations, whatever, whatever subsection uh, they're formed under. Uh, here's the corporate tax and yeah. Hill Corp, you need to pay it. State should be doing that. I just think, you know, the more I looked into this and I hadn't really considered it before when we've been talking about this, but because I was looking at different corporate structures um, in something that I'm working on right now, I was like, um, well, that makes sense uh, because again, the S Corp has definite advantages for a sole ownership or a partnered ownership situation where it's non-public. The C Corps obviously are built to go public or to have public investment, that kind of thing. So that made sense. And this is really on the state. Uh, it, you know, you can't, I can't blame Hill Corp for maximizing their profits or having their structure the way it was because of the way the company is. But this really is a failure of the state to go, well, wait a second, we missed something because they, you know, this was not really a thing back in the day. So we should get on this. And, and uh, I mean, that's, you know, again, I think the loophole uh, uh, phrase is a little loaded sometimes, like people are getting away with something, but it was within the law. That's, that's the thing, right? Well, but here, here's the deal, Michael, here's the deal when, when, and, and we just had an example of it this last legislature, when the state did try to close it, you remember Willikowski put in an amendment to right, one of right. the Cook Inlet bills. The state did try to close it, and Hill Corp all of a sudden, you know, puts in a full a, a full court press to kill that amendment and to keep their preferential their preferential situation. So, yes, it's on the state to fix it, but but Hill Corp's certainly trying to preserve it. Now, if you want to say they're revenue maximizing, okay, uh, that's 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 what they do. But her, Hill Corp certainly tried to tried to uh, spend a lot of effort trying to kill kill that amendment when the state tried to tried to fix the situation. Sort of regardless of who's responsible, uh, we've got a hole in the petroleum corporate tax, and there's two consequences of that. We're getting less revenue than than we would have than we would if we plugged the hole. And as a result of less revenue, we're taking more out of the out of the PFD uh, in order to plug the hole that's being created, as opposed to plugging the hole directly and having Hill Corp not pay more, but pay the same as every other uh, oil company uh, in the state. And now we find out with any uh, that, that 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 fungus is going to grow, uh, is capable of growing. And we're fueling the fungus growing by continuing to give them this this benefit, this this loophole that enables them to to be have a hyper competitive advantage. Uh, when they're trying to acquire uh, other properties. So they have a competitive advantage, they acquire another property, and all of a sudden the state loses the corporate income, the corporate income tax from, from that as well. I mean, you can paint a picture, I do charts, I could go out a long time and say, well, Hill Corp has this competitive advantage, they could then acquire Exxon's piece, they could acquire ConocoPhillips's piece, and you know, and all of a sudden we have a, a zero corporate tax income coming uh, coming from the slope. That's not what the petroleum corporate tax was intended to do. Petroleum corporate right. tax was intended to be a fifth, a fifth piece, a third largest piece of the overall tax to, to grab a share or to take a share of the of the income uh, earned by uh, by the oil companies in the state. Right. And that's that's what it's designed yeah. to do. I'm in 100 percent agreement with you, Brad, of all the effects of this. I'm in 100 percent agreement. But at the same time. I th this is a failure in my mind. This is a failure of the state. If they want to capture that, then the state needs to do something. And of course, Hill Corp. I mean, if I was an S Corp and they all of a sudden, let's just say they were going to tax all. I am an S Corp for this business for my for every. So if all of a sudden they said we're going to tax all the S Corps 
Um, and it, I would fight back against that in the legislature because it would affect me directly. Of course, I'm going to fight back. So I can't necessarily, I see what you're saying. I agree with all the effects, but I think Hill Corp is doing what Hill Corp was supposed to do, which is look out for the interests of their shareholders. Um, and this is on the state to get on the ball and do this if this is what they want to do. Right. And the state's not doing what it's supposed to do. The state is supposed to be maintaining this, 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 this five pronged, uh, tax approach with respect to petroleum companies in the state. I mean, the corporate income tax allows the state to have a lower production tax. The corporate income tax allows the state to have a lower oil property tax because a portion of the revenue is going to be raised through, cor through corporate revenues. And, and, and everything has been designed around everything else working the way it's supposed to work. What ha what's happened is through this, what, however you want to call it, I keep, I keep calling it a loophole because that's what it is, but I'm, and it's not, a, I mean, it's just, a, it's a loophole in the law, uh, whatever you want, but whatever you want to call it, because of that, not all of the pieces of the, of the petroleum tax code are working. And when you don't right. have all of those pieces working, you've got a hole that's got to be, since we continue spending, you've got a hole that's got to be filled by something else that's coming from, coming from permanent fund dividends. And we've created a situation in which that can now I mean, any right. is demonstrating that it can con continue to grow. Right. And again, this is, this is a failure of the state. If we extrapolate it out to your, your scenario where they basically consume Exxon and, and, and Conoco and all that other kind of stuff, man, the legislature, you can hear the puckering up from here because all of a sudden they realize how much they're actually losing. They would have to do something at that point um, or cut the budget. I mean, either way, maybe that's the perfect know. way. You know, maybe that's the starve the beast thing. I don't, I don't know. It's uh, it's either that I or just, I guess they hit us with the income tax, one or the other. They'll just keep cutting the PFD, Michael. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the really tragic thing here. We got oil companies skipping out on tax bills through, through the state's failure to close the loophole, if we want to put it that way. We had oil companies skipping out on, on, on tax bills, and we're shifting the burden to the PFD through additional PFD cuts. We're shifting the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. We're not even shifting it to, to you know, non-residents aren't picking up a share of this. Non-residents that are working on the slope aren't picking up a share of this. It's all being shifted to middle and lower income Alaska families. And it's just, uh, it, 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 the tax code has a hole in it that needs to be closed. Yeah. Well, and that's on the state. Uh, now you got to find 21 and 11 people who agree with us uh, that that's what should happen there. So, all right, Brad. Well, thank you so much for coming on board. Enjoy the music, my friend. Enjoy your time off in your sacred place. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming Michael's on board. Always, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>